Welcome back to Intro to Anthropo Physical Anthropology. I'm David Leitner. I'm your instructor. Uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about why bipedalism evolved in the first place. There are a number of theories, but uh, uh, and I'm going to give you some of the pros and cons of each of them right now. The truth is, it's still kind of an open debate. Uh, although evidence is starting to point very strongly more towards some of these theories than others. So, with that said, let's review the climate over the last six million years. So, the top row is the past sort of five and a half million years or so of average temperatures uh, globally. And you can see it's been a steady downward trend. Uh, however, as we get to more recent times, the fluctuations get more and more uh, uh, severe and more cyclical. Um, bipedalism develops back here. Our first evidence of it uh, in any apes is actually between four and eight million years ago, roughly. And, um, and it's important to remember that. Because one of the big things here, uh, and one of the problems some of these theories are now facing, is that a lot of them assume that bipedalism developed in the grasslands. Uh, but the environments back here are still largely forested. Uh, and the remains we find are largely living in dense forests. So, right, that presents some problems for us. So... Uh, we'll get into that more when we actually talk about sort of those early hominins, but I just wanted to sort of flag that at this point. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that all of these theories are kind of being sort of reassessed. So there are three main kinds of theories that, um, that are going around about the evolution of bipedalism. Some make a case for bipedalism being energy efficient. Others make a case for the ecology and the diet influencing the need for bipedalism. And finally, there are those that argue that bipedalism is largely a, the re result of a switch in mating strategies and due to sexual selection. I'm going to start with energy efficiency. Uh, I'll admit, I'm a little biased. These are my favorite uh, <laughs> theories right here. And I kind of think they apply to every one of these. Okay, um, Modern bipeds, like ourselves, who are fully adapted to walking bipedally, um, have a great deal of energy. We have a great advantage in terms of energy expenditure when we move than even a chimp walking bipedally. Um, we consume far less oxygen than a chimp does walking bipedally or quadrupedally. They're, they consume roughly the same either way, but we consume much less when we're walking. Um, and in fact, actually, there are some, there's some fossil evidence from the Australopithecine showing that even they, these incomplete bipeds, already have some of these energy efficiencies. This is really important because one big factor in evolution is, and a factor in reproductive fitness is how much energy you have to spend to do a thing and how much energy versus how much energy you bring in. And so this can have a major impact, uh, as a selected feature given the right conditions. Uh, another version of this is also is called the radiator hypothesis, where it's less about oxygen consumption and more about the efficiency of distributing, uh, dissipating the heat that big brains um, use. Uh, the idea here is that as our brains got bigger, not only are they becoming more energy hungry, when they use that energy, they release heat, and that heat needs to dissipate more efficiently. Now, walking bipedally has two advantages uh, in terms of heat dissipation and, uh, and energy efficiency over walking quadrupedally. The first is that if you uh, take any object, right, 
and shine the sun directly down on it, the way it does at the equator, um, it will cast a very small shadow, right? Versus when you, if you hold it like this, right? That's going to cast a very large shadow. You can even try this with your phone or with a doll or anything you want. Uh, but the idea here is that if it's casting a small shadow, then there is very little sunlight directly hitting the, the body. It's a very small amount of the surface area that is being heated, which means there's less energy being put into the body in the first place, which is important. But if you are walking upright in, say, a savanna, you are more likely to catch cross breezes than if you're low to the ground. Uh, and this is true regardless of how tall the grass is. Uh, so, um, the, uh, the wind comes in and cools you off. Whether you can sweat or not, it will do that. It does it more efficiently with creatures that can sweat. And we'll talk a little bit about when maybe human sweat, uh, the density of human sweat glands sort of became as large as it is today. But, uh, but for now, just understand this theory sort of depends on these two things being true. But like I said... There's a bit of a problem here, because if this is the driving force behind bipedalism, then we've got a problem, because our first fossil evidence of it is from dense forests, not from grasslands. And neither of these advantages would come into play in a dense forest. Um, the ecology and diet. Um, early hominins still depended largely on fruit trees. Okay, they were still largely frugivorous. And, in fact, actually, again, like I say, these very earliest ones were still living in dense forests. Um, as the late Miocene cooling trend continues, the forests do shrink and the grasslands do expand. Uh, as fruit trees become more scattered, uh, the ancestors that are trying to get the fruit, have to travel farther to get that food. Uh, with fruit less plentiful, being able to reach into the higher branches by standing up, uh, or even climbing into the tree to stand up, you, uh, you might have the encouragement, or sorry, the, I say encouragement, it may have created a condition where being more fit for bipedal locomotion is an advantage, right? Um, also, we know that you can carry things when you walk bipedally. We see chimpanzees walk bipedally all the time. They just only do it over relatively short distances, maybe a maximum of 100 yards or so. Remember, they live in a relatively resource-rich environment, so they don't have to travel that far for their food. They will, as a group, travel through the territory at times, but um, but for the most part, they don't have to travel that far. But even with that said, they will carry fruit back to their camp sometimes. Finally, again, depending on this, this savanna hypothesis, standing gives you an advantage over um, being on all fours because you can see predators coming, whereas you might not if you're down at grass level. Okay. The final model here is the provisioning model. This holds that sexual selection and mate choice had a major impact on the evolution of bipedalism. The, this is, was developed by C.O. and Lovejoy in the 1980s, and it combined information about the ancient climate, about anatomy, and about reproductive physiology. First off, compared to monkeys, apes, uh, just, and hominins are in that group, are case-selected. Case-selected means that they have long interbirth intervals, high maternal investment in their children, and that leads to a slow population growth, reaching some kind of equilibrium eventually. Compared to apes, uh, monkeys are R-selected. They are more R-selected. That is, compared to apes, they have short, excuse me, shorter interbirth intervals, less maternal investment, and faster population growth. They have more boom-bust cycles. You can see that on this chart here. 
because the case selected species is population growth is represented in blue. The red represents the R selected species. The R selected, you notice, has very rapid population growth, but also very rapid sort of declines in population. Whereas the case selected will have a more steady, even, but slower population growth. Now, this is important because the more generations you have in a lifetime, the more, more reproductive cycles you go through, uh, the more likely it is that mutations can arise that natural selection might or might not be able to work on. It just increases the likelihood that there's something for natural selection to work on. Uh, in a sense, that means that one species can evolve faster than another. Um, one of the reasons uh, viruses and bacteria like COVID throw up new variants all the time is because they have many generations a day, right? Many sort of reproductive events every day. And uh, so they're throwing up mutations all the time, which makes them highly adaptable. Now we would expect to see a decline in uh, towards extinction in the numbers of ape species. In fact, we do see this in the in the late Miocene and even continuing on till today. Uh, apes were plentiful at the height of the Miocene and they have the variety and of uh, ape species has been uh, be, been pruned off uh, continuously over these several million years. But that didn't happen with monkeys because they threw up our selection. Monkeys actually diversified quite a bit. Um, hominins are the exception to the ape rule here, though. Hominins seem to flourish and diversify. Why? Um, for Lovejoy, hominins must have had a change in their reproductive strategy that gave them advantages even though they were case-selected. For him, it was the development of monogamous mating and the loss of external sig signs of estrus. That is the physiological signs that a, uh, that a female is receptive and capable of conceiving. Uh, that is, she's fertile at that moment. Um, some species have false signs of estrus where they may exhibit estrus at times that they're not actually fertile to encourage more mating. Um, others have no signs of estrus, uh, or very few signs of estrus. Um, in humans, estrus is largely disguised uh, through a combination of things like, uh, uh, well, there, there is no there is no swelling of the sexual organs, which happens uh, in estrus in, say, chimpanzees. Um, sw the swelling of breasts is permanent, so that is not an indicator of when a woman is, um, is fertile or not. So humans are peculiar, and Lovejoy is saying, okay, there's something here that happened in evolution. Maybe it has to do with, um, uh, bipedalism as well. So he notes that there's this dual tension. Males need to ensure paternity uh, so that they know the offspring are their offspring, which monogamous relationships are more likely to sort of produce a reliable um, uh, lineage. Um, but when that happens, you have to travel pretty far to sort of bring stuff back. The mother is going to spend all of her time with the children and the father will uh, will be provisioning for both himself and the woman and the or sorry the the female and the offspring um needing to go farther being able to carry more those would all be advantages that might lead to bipedalism females at the same time needed to ensure continual male support so hidden estrus basically says 
maybe this is your kid, maybe it, maybe it happened when you weren't here, but you don't know, so you better treat it like your own. Uh, and um, that encourages males to have frequent sexual contact with their partners instead of just during fertile periods, and that in turn increases the male's chance of successfully um, impregnating the female and increases the female's rely uh, increases the female's confidence in the reliability of the male. Um, as I've mentioned before, the carrying of things. In fact, actually, some of the reasons chimps and gorillas even will carry uh, food long distances is to give it to females uh, to garner some kind of favor, sexual or political in nature. Um, so it's not inconceivable that humans might, early humans might have done this, early hominins. But um, there are some really big problems with this one, uh, not the least of which, again, it assumes these grassland niches uh, are necessary uh, for because it assumes that food is is getting fewer and farther between, that, which necessitates more time away, that sort of thing. And as we know now, the first signs of bipedalism don't happen in that environment. Perhaps more, I think, problematic here is the assumption of monogamy as the default. Um, there's no great evidence that um, uh, the earliest hominins were not monogamous. Um, uh, but also there's not great evidence. Monogamy seems to fluctuate and we only have very indirect evidence of this, largely the degrees of sexual dimorphism. That is the differences in, uh, anatomy and physiology of the males and the females, um, the degree of difference. Um, that fluctuates up and down, and certain things that, um, uh, you know, you would assume that to develop monogamy, the situation would have been non-monogamy in the first place, in which case we have high male-to-male -male competition, and that competition usually leads to things in, in apes, it leads to very large canines. Males tend to have much larger canines. The earliest hominins have very small canines. That's like one of the first changes we see. So, um, yeah, it, it doesn't seem likely that the, uh, that the sexual dimorphism explanation really makes a ton of sense. It may explain certain features later on, but uh, yeah, it, it, it doesn't seem real likely. And yes, I am biased, but still. Um, in summary, bipedalism occurred in the midst of a changing environment. There are three main theories, energy efficiency, ecology and diet, and sexual selection. And the current research really points toward some kinds of energy efficiency explanations and some kinds of ecological models. Um, but anything that relies on a grassland environment being one of the selective pressures is a problem because we know that the fossil, the first fossils we find that are bipedal are definitely living in heavily forested regions. So, um, so we have to rethink a lot of these explanations is what I'm saying. And that it's a lively debate. This is one of those things. If you want to become a grad student in physical anthropology, this is a great area to go into, uh, because again, our knowledge about it is changing every day as we discover more and more fossils. So being able to explain this, and and it's likely to be a very complicated explanation. These features didn't all come together at once, so they probably didn't all come together for, for one reason either. Uh, so it's going to be a fascinating field of study for a long time to come. You're going to definitely have some job security there. Anyways, uh, with that said, thank you very much. Uh, next time we're going to talk a little bit about early hominins and who are some of these very first bipeds and how do we know they were bipeds and are any of them our direct ancestors or were they just sort of offshoots that, you know, evolution forgot? Um, we'll see. Take care of yourself 
Uh, hope you have a great week, and um, I'll see you soon.